Well, welcome. It's a, it's a human nature, I think, especially among farmers, to, to want to get in nuts and bolts and how, and nobody wants to talk too much about the why, but I think it's, it's ever bit as important. And this morning's presentation uh, is, is a very interesting fellow, Reggie, Reginaldo haslett Marikin. We met him uh, a year or so ago at a formative meeting for Regeneration International, and his story is, is fascinating and compelling and practical, because he's got the nuts and bolts down in spades, which he'll do in another session. We've worked with him this past year on an interesting book, uh, the, In the Shadow of Green Man. It's a combination of his personal journey and parables from his native Guatemala. Please welcome Reggie. Thank you, it's really nice to be here today with all of you and I hope we can excite some storytelling here in the old ways. Um, there's something we have to know about storytelling and that is, um, it's probably one of the most effective in the ancient way of actually teaching. The um, storytelling uh, tradition uh, and it, the power behind it is, is really about not teaching just knowledge, but actually teaching um, knowledge associated with wisdom. And in today's society, in today's world, especially in agriculture, we have so much knowledge and so little wisdom that we have come to, to graduate very dangerous professionals that are destroying the world. So that is really where we start with this story is, is where, you know, where there is poverty, where there is hunger, normally you tend to fall into that trap of thinking that others know better. And that's where the experts and professionals come in and sometimes can really destroy your own ability to get out of that poverty. And so it is in that spirit that we have used storytelling as one of the fundamental ways of transmitting the knowledge of regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture is not something that is in the short term is going to be taught in universities. And just like sustainable agriculture and organics got corrupted and now it's been taught just the same way as conventional agriculture and just became an offshoot of conventional agriculture with corn and soybeans still as the foundation of the idea, which is no different than conventional anyway. That same way, I think there's a lot of, going to be a lot more corruption of ideas like regenerative. And this is one of the areas that I personally have dedicated a lot of time is to creating a narrative that is really representative of the foundational thinking behind regenerative design and engineering. So with that in mind, I'll tell you part of my story as an individual coming out of these conditions, but also uh, my story uh, uh, as, as a, as a professional working to re-engineer the way we grow food and how we went about that. So there will be a combination. And then tomorrow we'll go deep into as many details as you want, all the way from biophysics to chemistry, to engineering, to math if you want to, to economics, to large-scale system engineering and deployment, and so on and so forth. And with me is um, Wilbert de la Rosa, who's also from Guatemala, an engineer from Zamorano School of Agriculture. We grew up in very similar conditions and he's now in, under training to become one of our system deployers. Um, and Tony, who's the manager of our first uh, um, for-profit enterprise in Minnesota called Regeneration Farms. And Will, who will be filming, who's our communications director at Main Street Project. So with that in mind, let's move on to some of our material for today. <coughs> Hunger is a really powerful motivator if you're being, if you're being hungry, or if you have experienced poverty, uh, you will know that you cannot voluntarily do that. This is a, a story of a friend of mine who told me once that he had decided to become, uh, to take a vo vow of voluntary poverty, and I respect him a lot. So it was not something I wanted to laugh about, but such thing is an oxymoron. You can't be voluntarily poor. You, you will never know what it feels like. Um, and if you already were born in privilege, with all the characteristics that define privilege, you just can't be poor voluntarily. That's just the end of that. And so when you are in those conditions, there is a lot of things that you just are ready to take on. 
One of the reasons the United States and many other developed countries are not changing fast enough is because life is comfortable. So everybody's got food, whether it's killing you or not, still you get the sense that you have it. If you actually don't have it at all, then you will change quickly to get that food. And that's why the third world countries, you know, underdeveloped countries, are advancing way faster in regenerative agriculture system deployment than the developed countries. So this is a challenge for you to start thinking about what nuts in your head need to be you know, tightened up and so on, and what attitudes need to be changed in order for us to start accepting that that this world really needs to change and it doesn't change if we don't do it ourselves. So this process that we went through had some characteristics and I just outlined four of them for, for you to think through with me. One of the things we did very carefully was follow na nature's path. And we didn't know exactly the science behind it, but we knew what worked. And I will show you a diagram that is more scientific in a few minutes that shows how that nature path allowed us to engineer without actually having the training, but just having the wisdom to understand and to read nature. So um, that was the first thing. And one of the things you look at is, you know, in, in, is the, the geoevolutionary characteristics of things. One of the big mistakes of the organic movement was to give up the original idea of organics, which was not the elimination of chemical, synthetic chemical inputs. That was not what organics were, were originally designed for. The organic idea was really about creating an organic way of building a new way of farming. And, and then it got co-opted and it became just an offshoot of conventional grain production systems. And so people wanted non-chemicals, we'll give you non-chemicals, we'll give you the same thing, right? And that's why Dr. Anderson's presentation yesterday is so critical to understand because the result is the same. It's still unhealthy eating. And so we have to move beyond that, but organics are important because it gives us a stepping stone in order to start understanding closer how biophysical and geoevolutionary processes actually function. And that we understood really well but not because anybody taught us from outside. It was just basic observation of nature and following the path, you know. So patience, nothing that is good is quick. That's just as simple as that. Good food can't be f pushed, can't be made fast. Um, and especially in, the, in our case, because of the poultry and the center of our design, and you will know why even very soon, the perennial um, forest or jungle-like infrastructure is critical for, for, not for uh, regenerative poultry to happen, regenerative as in balanced biophysical chemical processes that allows us to integrate energy cycles. So patience is the other key ingredient that we had, even though we were hungry, we discipline our minds and our bodies to actually be able to move through slowly so that we could actually solve our problems rather than patch it, which is what all of the aid agencies wanted to do, was patch it for us so that we would just keep going and doing the things that the developed countries wanted us to do. And we said, no, thank you. We'll rather go hungry a little bit longer, but actually solve our problem of hunger and poverty. And that's why my path is truly from poverty and hunger to food security and hope, but that required patience. And that will, that will be something I want you to take home wisdom again, just to remember that just knowing things because you learned it at the university doesn't make you a good steward of the land. And that's how we have so many professionals destroying our earth. A way of thinking. You can't just think of the immediate need, the immediate project in front of you just your farm. If that's as far as you think, then you're still not going to be able to solve the issues at the scale that we need to solve them. Systems thinking is very different. A farm is a project, it's not a system. It may be part of a system, but only when designed to be so. Not as a matter of just aggregating farm after farm. That's one of the reasons we don't have a sustainable system per se or a regenerative system yet. The only system that we actually have today, if we just analyze it on its political, social, economic power, is the conventional system. 
they still govern pretty much everything. Even in the organic sector, they still govern what is produced on farms. So that means we haven't yet created a separate alternative system, and that we must do. And for me, it's like we have to move all the way to regenerative systems and not make the same mistake from the science perspective as we did with the other systems we have so far um, tinkered with. So <coughs> if you want to understand a path out of poverty, and in, in my personal story, um, you will have to understand two levels of poverty. One is the economic or what we call material poverty, which is what's used to define poor communities or poor countries. This is really mostly about things, stuff, whether you have money, whether you have income, whether you have a job, whether the country has a GDP that matches with the ideas of linear thinkers and economic linear thinkers and so on and so forth. Under that, under that um, definition, we were extremely poor. In fact, I talk about in, in the condition I grew up in, there was the, 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 the rich, the super rich in Guatemala, which is about 16 families in the whole country that control about 90% of all the land, productive land. Then there is the rich, but not super rich, and so on and so forth. We got multiple classes. And then there is poverty, and then there is misery, and then there is nothing. So we were just between misery and nothing growing up. But in those conditions, we had tremendous amounts of natural resources we could work with. And it was nat nat that natural-based thinking that allowed us to start at least feeding ourselves a balanced diet so that our brains would not suffer from the material poverty. But more important than that was the second definition. We grew up with really solid, strong, spiritual, and values-based sort of upbringing. That spiritual grounding based on appreciating just creation the way it is and working with it to, to allow it to be give us everything it wants to give us rather than interrupting its processes and extracting and imposing our homocentric views on it. That is really the foundation of spiritual, the spirituality with nature and agriculture. And that ba you know, combined with a values-based sort of um, uh, grounding in terms of principles that guided us through life, you know, you shall not kill, you shall not rob, you know, steal, you shall not, all of those things that a lot of us are familiar with, gives us a real, gave us a really rich upbringing, rich community. So we were spiritually and values rich, and meanwhile, we were cataloged as economically, materially poor. Now, very quickly, we realized that that was not true either. So we ended up realizing that our path out was to recognize that we were rich in both ways, but we had to reconcile what we expected as a way out of poverty. Now, what was the definition of non-poverty conditions, for example? We had to redefine that ourselves, rather than letting the world outside define it for you, because when you let that happen, then you become obsessed with this whole thing you call the American dream. And when that becomes, your obsession and your way of life, your purpose for living, you lose the spirituality of your, the purpose of life, and you also lose the fact that there is no end to that. That actually you can't achieve all of these things that the American dream, so-called American dream, calls for without having to step on somebody and to violate the very principles that are the foundation of happiness. Those are really profound things, and if you read the Dalai Lama, he, he puts it in way more eloquent words than I could ever attempt to. So, that's where we are. The rich, the super rich, the, the, the greedy people in this world who control most of our lives through corporations and products that are, you know, bom we're bombarded with are really coming from this second level of poverty. I honestly think they are the poorest people in this world even though they got the most material wealth. So let's keep that in mind as we go forward. Regenerative agriculture won't happen if we get confused with this, those, these two things. <clears throat> so when we go to nature, we will learn real things, lots of them. One thing, if you thought, uh, if you grow chickens, remember they are, they are jungle animals. It's the closest relative right now to T-Rex. I don't know if you knew that, but 
this is a pretty fascinating fact that Will Crumby just found last yesterday, and I said we had to put it in there because <clears throat> I have been making this argument of geoevolutionary blueprint of chickens and why we approach it the way we do and why we have come to kind of become unpopular in certain sectors because we will not talk about pasture chicken. That's an oxymoron. The geoevolutionary blueprint of the chicken doesn't line up with pastures. It doesn't line up with almost all of the stuff we have come to believe as a concluding you know, way of doing some of this work because we are refusing to listen to nature. This is the first thing we have to listen to and observe carefully. The second thing is that, that chickens are really jung it's a jungle fall. Yeah. It, it evolved over the, this, uh, the Asian jungles. That's where it originally came from. And you cannot remove that blueprint out of them. Even the deteriorated, degenerated white broiler, industrial broiler, still, and it's somewhere deep, if you let it out, it's still going to behave like that old chicken, even at that point. Any, any other, other variety, any other variety of, of, of chicken is going to have that, those instincts way more, way stronger. And so we, if we want to actually move into an area of regenerative design, these are facts that if we ignore, we're never going to arrive there. <clears throat> we started dealing with the chicken about 10,000 years ago. Some of the uh, British agencies that track this are talking about 17,000, 14,000 years ago. The, the bottom line is, it was a long time ago since we started domesticating the chicken. The nice thing about it is that we started only manipulating it genetically recently. And that is a good thing for us because from the livestock options in the world, poultry is probably one of the most diverse that we, st where we still have a genome that we can tap into to keep that regenerative nature of the systems going forward. Again, you know, the white bird is an imposter, it's not a chicken. It pretends to be one, but <clears throat> the real chickens, they live outdoors. Just like me, we grew up in the forest. I, I was going crazy after 10 years of living in, the, in Minneapolis. And my wife knew it. So it was really getting out and free ranging ourselves or, or when I have to, I was gonna have to go back to Guatemala. <laughs> so, from understanding chickens, from a, a really deeper understanding of, of where these animals came from, and how they are so compatible with pretty much every small farmer in the world. If you think of livestock options, think about doing the chicken right, but also doing it for the right reason. If you want to interfere in a, um, in a dominant, oppressive, violent system like conventional agriculture has become, uh, you don't have to go very far to figure out some key strategies. For example, in Guatemala, we had an army that was over 850,000 strong fighting a rebel army that was no more than 10,000 rebels, right? But why were the rebels so successful at bringing a big army like that down to their knees? It wasn't because they confronted them in open fields. In fact, in open fields, rule number one of insurgency. If you confront an army like that in an open field, you are dead on arrival, simple as that, right? Strategy, strategy is the key to the game. And so when you think of a strategy to bring down a industrial complex that is so majestic, uh, so monstrous as the conventional food system, you can't go around confronting it in the open fields. You're dead on arrival. You can't also go around shooting everywhere. You, you, you're just gonna get yourself killed. You have to be highly strategic, and two characteristics of high levels of strategy are, first, you pick an entry point where you can have the largest ripple effect. That's the first thing. And the second characteristic of a winning strategy is that that point that you pick has the least amount of drag, cost, in other words, human, material, and so on and so forth. Now, if you think of the con industrial complex and where the dominant points are, grains are one of the pivots of Cargill, Monsanto, and so on and so forth. But why is that a pivot? Because we use them now for animal production. So from all the animals, po 
small tree is the only one that actually evolved over geological time to feed on small grains. So if we were to, I mean, and also the other, the other even bigger advantage is that poultry is the only, the single animal that covers the whole globe and is naturally there. We don't have to impose it because it, it covers, every ecology in the world can grow poultry pretty much, except for desert, deserts and, and places where there's no water or space, right, or land. But every other ecology would accommodate some kind of poultry, whether it's pigeons in, in Vietnam, or whether it's uh, bantams in China, or pheasants, or, or turkey, or, or, or the, the regular chicken, meat or egg layer. The key is that right now, 70%, despite that 70% of the food in the world is produced by small farmers, the claim of who feeds the world belongs to companies. They, they control the narrative of who feeds the world and let us feed the world. Now, if you want to change all of the producers in the world that produce that 70% of the food, you have to start with the chicken. It's the only animal, livestock option, that applies to all of them, 100% of them. And it doesn't matter if it's in Colombia and Hill sites or even the flatlands of Iowa. It applies just as well. So it's one thing that can bring farmers together across the world. Cattle can't do that. It's too expensive. It's too long. It only belongs in very specific ecological pockets of the world. If you're going to follow, follow nature's path, you're not going to be putting cattle in the rainforest, for example. You're going to put it with the buffalo were and so on and so forth. And that reduces you to a very small footprint, geographic footprint. And that doesn't give us the power to actually confront a power of the size of the conventional agricultural system. So back again, strategy is the name of the game. And the chicken is the center of that strategy because the chicken allows us to bring the social movement behind the small farmers of the world. That's nature's path. <coughs> now, if you want to follow the energy, if you want to talk about regenerative agriculture, energy is really the key. You don't follow economics for, as a starting point. You know, Chris Walters, you know, Fred Walters, the, ad, the founder of Acres USA, said it very careful, very, very eloquently said, for agriculture to be economical, it has to be ecological. Now, what does it mean ecological? It means that it has to regenerate the ecology on which food production depends instead of degenerating it. Now, how do you regenerate the ecology? You follow the energy paths. Because whenever you don't, whether you're using organic or non-organic products, the end result is if the energy, if you had excess energies in your system, you're going to end up with waste, and that waste we call pollution. Whether it was an organic product, certified organic product or not, it's still pollution, still chemicals, right? So the energy is the key. So how do you do that? First of all, <clears throat> in the case of poultry, you look at where the energy is coming from. We talk about intensive production, so we're not talking about poultry that it will go out there and eat bugs and, and survive on that. You, you will only be able to raise like five chickens per acre that way. <coughs> so we have feed coming in, some of it ground, some of it is coming in as whole grains, and we'll go in through that in the nuts and bolts, very specifically if you want to know how you can grow the best chickens. Um, so once that energy gets in, we got this free range, free ranging unit design that I'll show you in a second. But then you also have, because we are free ranging chickens, you got other kinds of energy coming in, mostly photons. This is really, if you, if you read Dr. Anderson's um, um, life uh, energy in agriculture, um, energy in agriculture, I think is the name of the book. But anyway, one thing you will learn is that um, only 20% of the growth of a plant depends on the soil and the nutrients and so on. 80% of it is actually atmospheric, is environmental driven. So photons are critical because that's an, a key free energy that we are getting for the purpose of producing something we can then later market. And it's critical to economic equation that Chris Walter was talking about. For agriculture to be economical, it has to be ecological, right? Well, that's what we are talking about. This is like the engineering part of a statement like that. So once we have those processes, then we have 
energy coming in, photons coming in, new energy, and then we can ignite those geo, you know, biophysical processes that are critical for that energy to be transformed into the multitude of molecule compounds that we need in order for a plant, an animal, or a person to feed themselves properly. Now, in our system, we have the in the paddock production where the chickens are roaming and so on in this jungle-like structure that we'll describe further later. And so we have that area there where, from which we harvest four primary products. In our case, in Minnesota specifically, if you go out, if we were presenting this in Mexico, I'll show you what the outputs in Mexico are, which are different. Or in Colombia, the outputs are different. We actually have a new proposal now called Poultry Center Regenerative Coffee. And we are proposing to change 30,000 small-scale farmers in the highlands of Colombia by putting the same process to work there. But in this case, meat, eggs, hazelnuts, and elderberries are the primary four products. Why the elderberries and the hazelnuts are the, if the jungle infrastructure that we're creating inside the paddocks, but they also produce valuable products for us, and they produce it on the basis of the energy that came in the form of, po of poultry feed that was then transformed to this process into food for these plants. We're not fertilizing, we're not weeding, we're not doing any of that. This is free production. And the poultry is healthier on top of it. Then in the, in the paddock, we also can harvest quite a variety of other non-marketable products. These are marketable. This is, the, this is where we, are, we start calculating the economics of the, of the system. This is where we calculate the energy flows. And so we have water filtration, we got carbon sequestration. Um, Gabe Brown will talk to you if you go to his presentation, or was it yesterday, or maybe today. But if you went to that in, in Wilbur and I visited his farm as part of our training ourselves, um, we can absorb most of the heavy rains that have been coming lately um, with the system because the massive amounts of, of um, um, tubular system, what we call um, um, uh, capillarity water systems, you know, um, are ready to absorb a lot of that extra flow. And so um, it's, not, it's not a small thing to talk about water filtration in regenerative culture and if those things are not engineered through through the process then we are again not really practicing regenerative agriculture we're falling back into that convenient let's just let's just manipulate this space so that you produce what we want instead of working with it to optimize what it wants to produce for us which is in levels of magnitude many times more than we can get out of it if we start manipulating it from a homocentric perspective so just relax your mind and let nature talk to you and it will give you way more than you ever imagined. And that, if you live in poverty, you have to do that. If you're privileged and you don't need that, you feel like, why go through all that trouble when I can just plant stuff, right? You see that, the difference? That's why we have to really change the way we think about this if we're gonna change the system. So then you move on and you have excess energy. Some of this excess energy, in the case of poultry, comes in the form of manure, giblets, feathers. Manure that was not deposited in the paddocks, that was deposited inside the shelters. Because chickens, even though they evolved in the jungles and all of that, at night they sought shelter up in the branches and all of that of the trees where they lived under. And so they still need that shelter at night because otherwise, you know, if you are in Minnesota or, or, or anywhere actually right now, you, you have stray dogs, you know, other animals that also want chicken for dinner. So, so you don't want to, you, you want to deny that to them, in other words, and hopefully you get more for yourself. But this, this, this excess energy then gets transformed again in, you know, with new energy, just the same way as here, in the, what we call the non-paddock-based production. So again, we have the excess energy, if we don't deal with it, it will become pollution somewhere, whether it's in the soil, the water, or in ourselves, or, or the air. So this non-paddock production is really what a lot of folks are calling agroforestry, or civil pasture systems, or whatever you, we call it, alley cropping, because we want to grow and harvest things that are useful for our food security, grains, 
fruits, vegetables, perennials, all of that. But we want to do that in a way that allows us to build biomes, biomes that will transform energy in ways that are more efficient than if we just, again, impose these things on the soil. Those biomes don't get built by single crops. This is why monocultures are so dangerous. It can be a perennial hazelnut grove, but if it's a monoculture, it's still a big problem because evolutionarily speaking, no plant evolved by itself. And so they are not equipped genetically to interpret all of the signals from the mycosphere in order to calculate how they are supposed to behave. And so they become weaker, um, underproduced, and so on and so forth. The only way to actually uh, have plants become efficient at what they know how to do is to rebuild some of that massive inter-root relationships that are what allows them to then do what our stomach does when we when you eat something, sprays acids and all of that, and then all of these nutrients get meshed up and then they start getting molecularly separated so that through the intestine movements we can extract all of those nutrients that we need for our survival, right? Well plants do the same. The difference is that they are doing it by reading the environment, the nutrients that are in there. And so accordingly, if they need some new nutrient, they will emit their own acids, their own exudation, so that they will feed the proper microbiological infrastructure so that they can produce the food that they need. The soil is their stomach, in a way. And so when we bring these alley crop systems and all of that, what we are doing is deliberately engineering those bio biomes since nature itself will probably not want to support all of us on Earth, we still have to do some manipulations so that it will, but not too much so that we destroy the fundamentals of its biophysical chemical infrastructure. So having done that, then we can produce again grains and all of that that can go back to the poultry uh, production, which closes a loop and some of this energy that would have otherwise gone outside comes back in here. So we are bringing grains all the way two years later from this poultry manure and so on and so forth, this fertilizer, and it's, we're putting it back into the system again. Now, if you want to talk economics, this is the way to produce with the least amount of expenses and do it forever. Energy cannot be produced or destroyed. It can only be transformed. If we forget that fundamental principle of thermodynamics, we screw everything up. So what can we do with this? What's the potential for engineering things this way? truly regenerative design. We can reorganize and transform all of these existing farms we're talking about. And again, well, I'm talking about small farms because that's where true revolution can be ignited. But it can be supported by any size farm. I can design you a 400 acre farm, 1,000 acre farm, 4,000 acre farm, it doesn't matter. There's no limit to it. But strategically, if we start with big farms, we'll end up with a lot of production but no social movement. Without social movements, we're dead on arrival again. We can relaunch, we can launch and grow new farmers. There's a lot of people who want to become farmers and don't, don't find a way in. Well, the chicken is the way in, really. A farmer who wants to do livestock and start with larger animals is gonna have a tremendous time getting off the ground. Meanwhile, the chicken could get them through the first years, especially if they do it in this system, without compromising the ability for them to switch later into other things. Meanwhile, starting on another, uh, with another entry point may not, even, may not, may not be uh, possible for them to survive. And then we don't have farmers to begin with at the end, even though there is a lot of interest. So this way we can actually do more effective launching of new farmers. We can integrate poultry center enterprise sectors, and I'll show you the map of what that looks like. And, and, and if you thought it was about the chickens, you're wrong. It's not about the chickens. The chicken is just the entry point. It's poultry center, but it's not about chickens. Engage as a scalable solution to poverty and food insecurity. We know how to solve poverty and food insecurity. And we don't need Bill Gates. We don't need the USAID. We don't need any of that. We already have everything that we need to solve that. The only thing that is missing is the actual desire to solve it. That's the only thing that is missing. And we can prove that, and that's why I want to tell you my story, because I am not going to take advice from anybody. 
in this area, except those who actually followed a similar path or who are willing to learn from that path. Because the other paths that are being proposed don't work. And the proof is in the way things are working, or not working, in other words. We got more poverty, we got more malnutrition, and we got more food insecurity today than we had before we had any problem to deal with those very things. So we don't need to argue on that one. We can actually replace, and I can do the numbers for you tomorrow if you want to, 100% of all of the confinement poultry production that exists today. We can replace that. And remember, if you're going to engage in a revolutionary act, you don't do that without a plan. Because if you win, you're screwed. And that's happened so many times all when just think about Iraq or whatever. Whether it was that way, whether it was the Sandinistas in Honduras without a plan. They won, but won what? So patience. An environment where poultry will thrive doesn't happen overnight. Now the key to that perennial environment we're talking about is that while the perennial environment develops, the chicken provides us sustenance and income and all of the things that we need to keep going. So when I work with Mark Shepard, for example, who's, who's a kind of got an umbilical cord connection to Acres USA, <coughs> just like me now, um, we talk about the, the business proposition for the farmer who's going to do hazelnuts isn't really the hazelnut. It should be poultry. Because the poultry is the ticket to getting the perennial cropping systems established. Without the poultry, six years before you will see a nut, you will go nuts before you see a nut. <laughs> so anyway, that's the key. If you're not patient, um, regenerative agriculture isn't for you. This is um, a place we just, I just came back from. This is a very tiny 200 egg layer chicken coop with paddock to that side and paddocks to this side in a steep 15 degrees hillside in Colombia in one of the indigenous regions we're working with. The first step in this case was really not the chicken. It was the fact that this was opium fields that these indigenous folks re re recovered from the drug dealers in the army. And, but their culture is really about slashing and burning everything in this steep hill, so it gets really bad when you start talking about nutrition runoff and all of that. So the first thing was to take, change that and build an understanding of the value of that soil so that we start treating it differently. And the second step is to regenerate it and increase production. And that part, using that formulaic approach, is very easy because the first thing you do is you identified all of the ecological, the, the species in that ecology that were already productive a thousand years ago and that people have traditionally used for food and so on and so forth, but also they have market value. So you start with a hundred different species and then you reduce them based on that criteria, but you still end up with native species when you build your, your P&Ls and, and balance sheets and all of that, rather than imposing the idea that just because soy and corn is what I want to grow, that's what I want to put in this space. That's the homocentric way of looking at a, at a landscape and an ecology. If you read the ecology, it may tell you that certain things you had in mind are not going to work. And if you can accept that, it will produce way more for you than otherwise. So that's what we did here. The challenge is, you know, there's a house way up here. And it, literally, if you don't look around when you walk in this thing, in this area, you fall off the field. <laughs> Michael Abelman, this photographer of California, produced a book like 15 years ago that called, you know, that, that where he said that farmers in Peru are known to fall off their fields. This is not a joke. It's for real. This is one of those fields. This was cut, burnt, just like they did for opium, and corn was planted there. So, if we don't know how that ecology was designed to produce wealth, we are always going to be poor. <laughs> so the key is now is to deploy, this, there's 23,000 hectares that these indigenous groups recovered. And we went there, I went there because they want to practice our system. So we're going to terrace probably all 23,000 hectares, it's a whole mountain. 
And if we can achieve that with these 1,000 people who live there already, we can change the whole region. And we don't never have to even go back there. We train 11, 11 experts or professionals in the areas. We're now going further and further so that they can create something that can just be repeated over and over and over and over. And they have the capacity to, to bring this, all of these people into these communal work days, so to speak. So actually, it would look like, like an army of regenerators right, in those fields. So a way of thinking, remember when we talked about not project-based thinking, but system-based thinking? Well, this is how <coughs> This is how it goes. When you think of a farm, but you think of it as your farm, sorry, you think it's as your farm, as in isolation from everything else, then you may end up with a nice looking, very productive farm, but you don't create systems that way. That's just your farm, and it may work for you, but what about everybody else? And since we have been kind of trained from elementary school to think that way, Developing systems in this day and age that are not conventional is very difficult. It's very hard to find people who think at the system level. Everybody wants to think at the farm level. And that's important. That's important for me and my farm. But that's not going to aggregate to a system unless the thinking I do on my farm is designed to aggregate as a system. And that's what we're talking about. It's a way of thinking as much as a way of doing things. So when you think about systems, you start with the foundational principles. That's how we got out of poverty. We had foundational principles. Principles are like lighthouses. Anytime you feel lost, you just look back to where the lighthouse is. And if you don't know how to uh, figure out where you are, you go back to the lighthouse and start all over again. But you never end up in the wrong place because you didn't have proper guidance. That's what principles do. And so five of these, five principles define really the foundation for our system. We're looking at resiliency. And resiliency is really not defined in the same terms as sustainability. <clears throat> sustainability for us is mostly about economics. If the system is economically, can be sustained economically, it's okay. But that doesn't make it resilient. Resiliency is really the result of understanding the geoevolutionary blueprints of every species. So a hazelnut is resilient not because we say so. It's because the process over geological time says so. We may be resilient, like the, like the, the, the white Cornish industrial bird is not resilient. We made it non-resilient, but it was before it was transformed that way. Genetically modified organisms are not resilient. They, are, they may be economically sustainable for the big companies. So is war. War is one of the most sustainable practices that we have had for as long as we have been you know, around this earth. That's why sustainable talk was so easy extracted and turned into something else. So now there is the sustainable water suppliers to the Vikings in Minnesota. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> Resiliency is a whole different thing. It's, it's not something we decide. It's something that happened, and it happened over billions of years. And that's the way we have to think about that part. When anybody says that they're going to improve a variety for you, think about that. Really? Can you do better than $60 billion of R&D in nature? <laughs> Don't even have the time to improve anything. Healthy is, really means healthy for you as a farmer, for me as a worker, for the consumer who's taking that product and putting it into their bodies. It's about everything, about everybody. It's about the animal's environment. That's why we will never grow confinement animals. It's just against nature and it's unhealthy. Fair is just about relationships. Think of free trade standards and principles. There's a lot of that. Transparent is just because everybody needs to know what's going on. That's why we share everything. Because everybody needs to know what this is like. Otherwise, somebody will tell you that it's something else that it wasn't meant to be. And so we cover the other two. Secular thinking. With those kinds of principles, we can, we can pursue 
a triple bottom line conventional way of thinking, more conventional. Social meaning we can engage a lot of people on the basis that we have already gone through. Economic, because when we work with the ecology, we always end up economically better. And unless we are only analyzing things from a linear thinking perspective, economists will have come to us, many of them, and we have engaged them in analyzing our system. And they just want to look at the chicken. I said, well, well, then you are not going to analyze the system. I said, well, we're going to analyze the, the chicken system. Is that the chicken is not a system, it's an animal. It's an animal that is part of a system. If you're not willing to analyze the system, well, you can't because we got to better look at the chicken. I said, well, here's the thing. Because we have been trained on thinking in lines, we can't see the big picture. And again, back to the challenge of trying to think in systems and analyze in systems, engineers in ter and engineer in terms of systems and strategize in terms of systems. If I'm a farmer, I don't want to strategize as a farmer. I want to strategize as part of a system because that's the only way I'm going to be out in about in the context of creating a new alternative to what we have today. So it goes all the way from economist to, to the farmer. But the triple bottom line is very doable if you design with the diagram we talked about and with the five principles we just described. This means, you know, you start with very simple proofs of concept, we call them prototypes. So the first thing we did was we incorporated the hazelnuts and then two annual crops for shade and more productivity. So this is native corn. These are hazelnuts from Mike Shepard's uh, stock. And these are sunflowers, large sunflowers so they will grow above. Bottom line is the chicken doesn't want to be in open space. It needs to be covered for it to actually roam and range all day. Otherwise, it's just going to go out when it's cloudy or when people are around. And that chicken is not going to be free ranged and it's not going to give you all of that potential we're talking about. Now, this could be in Guatemala. We, we're using a, a, a tree called Ramon because it produces this amazing fruit that is uh, more nutritious than soybeans and corn combined. And so we are using that to produce more food. Uh, the sunflowers actually are fed back to the chickens. Um, we have videos that will show you how crazy they go for the sunflowers. We just cut them, flip them, leave them out, and they chew them up. Yeah. And, and sunflowers are one of the most nutritious supplements for, for, for poultry. In fact, it's got up to 43% protein. And under this system with good fertilization, a lot of mulching that we do to keep the chickens from touching the bare ground, that gives the, the fruit a high nutrient density that is important for the chicken, but it's important for the eggs that we harvest. And I mean, this, I, I, I feel like I got the right to brag, even though that's still not acceptable socially, but our eggs are really the best eggs out there. <laughs> And you'll taste them. If you try them, you'll take an organic egg from the store and you'll take one of our eggs and you will notice the difference just as much as you notice between a conventional egg and an organic egg because this is truly way beyond organic. This is the shelter we're talking about. This is one of the paddocks. This is the, where I took that picture. The sunflowers already came down. You can see them laid down for the winter. And in this space, these hazelnuts, plants two years in a row have produced between four and six times more than the university reported cultivars. The design is pretty straightforward. Got a shelter, feed, space for the chickens on both sides so we can rotate them back and forth, and a whole booklet on agronomical management inside those paddocks. The key being the regenerative factor. We actually scientifically calculate that. The regenerative factor is the combination between grain sprouts and the, and the brain and all kinds of other factors that allows us to see how long it takes for the ground to be ready for, for, for chickens to roam and eat again. We call it foraging, not because they are eating grasses, but because they are eating short sprouts. That, and we could go on tomorrow, on the amazing properties of sprouts. 
Once a plant has grown three or four inches, a grain has grown three or four inches, it loses almost 90% of its nutritional value. So this whole thing about grass, you know, pasture chickens is, it so bothers me so much because it's such a myopic way of thinking about this beautiful animal and their magnificent ecological potential and economic potential and social potential that it actually has. So the other thing is we do these things because we also like to say we're allergic to work. As a farmer, I'm not interested in work. I'm interested in productivity. And if I could just, you know, wave a magic wand and have everything done for me, I would rather that. I mean, who the heck wants to go out there and get muddy and all that? So we don't want to be hauling feed. We don't want to be hauling water. We don't want to be scrambling in the winter to keep them warm. So this is a solarium where they can go during the day when it's sunny, and even if it's 30 below outside. And then as soon as it's warm, they can go outside and just have a good time. The egg layers go in 100% by themselves. Meat birds, the, the non-white birds, we never grow on those, but the birds we grow, you know, 95% of them go back in, and just shoot the last five back into the building. But your flock is 1,500 birds, so it's worth going out there and doing that. I don't call that work. It's great doing it with the kids. And you can tell them stories, and you can start going through the whole process of the storytelling that we were talking about. So my 13-year-old, he told me about a week ago, we were sitting down, and I was telling him how his 23-year-old brother, older brother, is he's really having trouble figuring out his purpose in life. He said, oh, I'm not. I'm, I'm just sure what I'm going to do. So what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be a farmer. <laughs> we, we don't impose any of that on our kids. I mean, I hope you don't do either. But it's so rewarding when you actually can see that naturally emerging in them. So even with the kids, you can work with nature. <laughs> This is the design of a, of a whole farm, 42 acres. It's owned by, but, um, but Will, Will Crumming is in the video. We are partners, we're business partners with Regeneration Farms. This is the first operation we're launching, which is being managed by Tony Wells, who's in there too. These are five production units, just roughly f about 100, you know, 13,900 birds, 14,000, round it up, that we're gonna be able to put here about $950,000 worth of farm level, farm gate income. And this is only 12 acres. Meanwhile, all of this is already planted in this lower field, 10 acres are already planted with 19,000 hazelnuts from Mark Shepard through another partnership with him. All of the manure will be distributed here. These are bands of um, multiple rows and on the outside el uh, elderberries, inside, will be two, another two rows of hazelnuts, and in the middle, one single row of alternating bushes of four kinds of oaks, um, sugar maples, and so on, to create bands, and then in between, 30-foot um, alleys, so that we can actually drive a combine if we so wanted to. The key is not locking ourselves into hard labor that is unnecessary, because the, all of this the resources out there are critical, and we need to incorporate as much as possible of the technology that has been developed without compromising those five principles we're talking about. If what we propose to use a combine for is either economically non-sustainable or interferes with the resiliency of our system, whether it's from water protection, from species restoration, or so on, then we must reject that. But if it lines up with our principles, why not use it, right? That's the key to thinking here. And that's how we designed this farm. It's now under deployment, one year into it. This first unit is being, is being built right now. This is what it looks like in real life once it was planted with the hazelnuts. We still gotta plant a lot coming in spring. But we have probably the largest elderberry cloning garden in the Midwest right now. We started out three years ago knowing that we'll need large amounts of stems and they are expensive. They're $1.98 a little twig. And so we figured, well, why not produce them ourselves? Again, thinking, you know, material, material wealth. We can grow, you know, hundreds of thousands of hazelnuts and hundreds of thousands of elderberries ourselves in patience. If we just wait two years, we can have every year now going forward almost half a million dollars worth of stems 
that we're not paying a penny for just the labor of harvesting them. What's the location here? This is um, Isler Avenue in Cannon City by Faribault, Minnesota. So if you go from here to scale, you take small scale, you make it large scale, you start again, this is the integration of the different enterprise sectors. Now poultry center, again, doesn't mean it's just about chickens. You can have eggs, you can have meat, but associated with that comes the aggregated enterprises. A whole system really is everything together. Pol meat poultry processing, for example, is critical. Most of that uh, infrastructure in this country was obliterated by the, by the consolidation of the conventional system. So we can rebuild that if we can build the productivity that allows us to create the throughput that makes this economically feasible. And now if we say one million birds is sufficient to set up a small processor in somewhere rural community, I can tell you exactly how many production units we need, how many farms, how many hazelnuts we're going to plant, how many elderberries we're going to have, how much productivity will be over the whole system so that we can supply one million birds to make this economically feasible. We didn't have those numbers from any of the books that I read. Are in the bookstore out here. You can go and look and see if you can extract that kind of mathematical calculation out of any of them. It is in there. That's why we had to do it. Now the key is then to incorporate the rest of it because regeneration means the whole system is regenerative. It's not about your farm again. It's about the system. And so grain processing is critical because we don't want to be, you know, to have this chokehold on us from the industry that produces grain and feed today. Right? So now that allows us to incorporate grain producers under a system that follows that alley cropping system and that kind of design that you just saw in the farm. Now we can tell 300 farmers around us that they can produce the 13 million pounds of feed that we're going to need for our poultry unit, for our, for our first farm. And now we can have actually go back into the conventional contract language and just say to the farmers, let's just make it fair and let's define what that means and apply the fair trade principle to bring these farmers in. And now we're talking about large landscape deployment. Manure management means we're going to have more of that, which means we can have more perennials outside of the paddocks, which means we can create industries about that. We are about to start the hazelnut industry and the elderberry industry in Minnesota just by the fact that we have poultry. Now, nobody talked about that before. For 40 years, the University of Wisconsin and River Falls and the University of Minnesota have been talking about perennial crops, and yet we still have to see a significant deployment of that. And meanwhile, we can do that not on the basis of perennial, but on the basis of the chickens. In total, we can be aggregating between 14 and 20 enterprise sectors, and that is the first principle the ripple effect. You can't create a revolution if you can't have the ripple effect. But guess what else happens? If you do this, another thing that happens is that you suck up a lot of the grain and you take a lot of the grain, the grain producing landscape away from the conventional industry. Now, if you want to know what kind of disruptive power that has, just look at one of the farms in Iowa with two, three hundred employees where immigration has gone and taken 10, 15 of those employees and deported them. And look at how the farmers scramble for months, sometimes years, to figure out how to replace that disruptive capacity of a system that actually tackles the foundational weaknesses of a conventional large system is immense. That's how you win an insurgency. You don't win it in an open field. Scaling up, this is the process, pretty straightforward. Proof of concept, you saw that. Farm level, you saw that. Now we're going to the regional, which you just saw. Then we institutionalize it. That means our schools, our high schools, our colleges, universities need to be teaching this curriculum. And if we have that kind of power, we can actually demand that they do. We don't have to beg for it. So we started in southeastern Minnesota. We mapped out 5% of the market. We calculated what it was in actually meat, birds, and eggs that we would need to produce. We took this back and we said, we need this many family farms producing this many meat birds. And in total, we need about 819 acres in poultry production units. 
and I'll, I'll just share you 3,000 acres of landscape non-paddock management to produce all the grains and everything so that system can be completed full circle. This is probably smaller than an average large farm in Iowa for a whole system. But what does it do? Look at the impact. We calculated this at farm level value. And this we're talking about the price of the eggs that we're selling right now and the meat chickens we're selling right now. It's not pulled out of thin air. But that level produces at about $74 million of economic impact on the farm alone. The ecological impact, about 3,500 acres in total. And is, but also this means restoring that landscape to full productivity. If you look at the comparative analysis, out of the same space, conventional agriculture produces about $4.2 million right now from where we produced 74. The ratio is between 1 and 10, 1 to 10 to 1 in 15. The multiplier ripple economic effect of our system is between 5 and 10, while the conventional agriculture system has a negative effect of for every dollar you harvest 75 cents. The difference is paid by taxpayers and by the people downriver. You say the multiplier effect is, is essentially 5 to 10? 5 to 10. For every dollar that you invest, you can bring back 5 to 10 to 12 dollars. So the system institutionalization is simply integrated into existing efforts, track and report data for global application. We're not talking about a little project in a corner somewhere. Certify. If regenerative certification is what needs to be done, well, that's what we'll do. Otherwise, maybe this can be organic fair trade and just have 10 labels on it. And then integrate with our established educational system so we can institutionalize this for future generations and then start telling these stories, not in limited spaces like this, but everywhere. Right now, we're doing this in, in Minnesota where we have our center of operations. In South Dakota, we're working with the Pine Ridge Indigenous Reservation, Guanajuato, Mexico. Granjas Regenerativas in cooperation with the Organic Consumers Association and Regeneration International. In Northern Guatemala, we'll be having a, an operation in the rainforest. That's where I was born and grew up, and we are bringing this back to that community as well. And we are exploring right now the partnership with Zamorano in Honduras. We already have a team in North Central Haiti, and we just came back from training that team of 11 people in Colombia. Remember, a happy chicken. It's a chicken in the jungle. Really appreciate you coming today.